So we have uh, seen on one side there is a omnipresent reality. We call it the divine, the supreme, the transcendent or various names. And on the other side is the vision of the ego, understanding of the ego. And ego is a temporary construct, a, a lens which is tainted with its own desires, wishes, hopes, ideas, conventions, social conditioning, ideas of good and bad, painful and pleasant. And it sees this universe through that lens. So a question may arise that why is this lens given? Well, this lens is given because in the beginning it cannot, if it suddenly sees that full truth, it may completely get unsettled. That's why we see that children, when they grow from, say, step one till they grow adult, so there is this concept which has come nowadays to give freedom to a child. <laughs> but it implies a progressive freedom. To a five-year-old, you can't say you have uh, you make your own choices because the child is not even equipped to make the choices. Of course, there is another school of thought that he will fall and rise and ultimately figure out. Well, animals do go through that. <laughs> there is no schooling, no tutoring because in animals, there is an intuitive, instinctive way of life. But in human beings, it's more like a discovery. So ego looks at world purely from the dualistic standpoint. What is this dualistic standpoint? It looks at one side and looks at the other side. And it divides life into good and bad, right and wrong, painful and pleasant, etc, etc. So should we take away that? No, this is necessary at a certain stage. That's what Sri is telling us. The knowers do not confuse those who do not know. And that's why those who know are very much misunderstood because the standpoint changes completely. And yet it is necessary in the beginning for man to use these crutches of duality. And sometimes based on this duality, he also erects images of God. He erects a heaven where he is rewarded. He erects a hell. He erects a God who will do justice to him ultimately. And he erects, uh, you know, a punishment that he will met out to those who are our personal enemies and so on and so forth. It's, these are conceptions which human beings build. There are many other conceptions. For example, if we see that a person who is... Um, People ask this question also during Corona time, why did a devotee die, a particular devotee, you know. So this is because we are looking at things from a very small step. We are not seeing what is happening subsequently. There is a very beautiful poem of Sri Aurobindo, which um, uh, post tsunami I had given in an article and sent it to Mother India. It's a beautiful poem about the lost boat. So the lost boat is when you see from, his, from the shore a boat is going, fighting the waves and then it is lost, it never comes back. So, our understanding is of one kind. But we have no idea what happened subsequently. So, all our value judgments are based on a very small, narrow selection. And that selection is largely a play on the surface. And therefore, we do not understand God's play. And because we do not understand, and yet something in us hopes for an ideal. It is intuitively built, inbuilt in us because it hopes for an ideal. So we say, well, the ideal is either elsewhere in some heaven or this ideal is a malady of the mind. These are the two kinds of logic human beings use. But then there is a gap between the practical and the ideal which has to be bridged successively by passing through what we may call as, what the mother calls as, as successive illusions. Each illusion enlarges the scope and the field. And therefore, many errors, approximations through which we arrive at truth. This is how it is built. It is not um, one day that this is a world of ego and therefore there is only one reality. Imagine telling this to a child. 
people say that often and i remember one uh, person who came he said what is the use of studying and he uh, told me i had just come to the ashram he said i i was studying history and something etc but i was told what is the point of studying why because ultimately you have to find the divine this is such a dangerous fallacy yes you have to find the divine but are you equipped to find the divine by giving up studies you have to go through a whole process there is another very interesting example that i had that someone came and uh, was telling me that uh, um, is it good to take care of the dogs or not <laughs> i said well depends but what is the context because always we should ask the context so this uh, child says that basically that uh, she was petting a dog and you know she was feeding the dog and suddenly somebody comes not even knowing what is her goal or not and says your goal is not to feed the cats and dogs your goal is to love only the divine loving dogs is not the way you should not be loving dogs you should love the divine now you see yes but one could equally say but the divine is in all beings but that apart now suddenly this child doesn't even know what is love he doesn't even know what is self love forget about loving the family and loving that's why the divine is so patient he first establishes a family unit then the nation unit then the world unit then go transcend the world it step by step he is leading but we suddenly tell a 10 year old child that you know you should not love anyone anything except the divine now this is what creates confusion in the minds of people and uh, shobindo cautions uh, what is there given to us in the gita that this practical arrangement is necessary otherwise page 58 we read yesterday this no doubt is the root of the injunction imposed in the gita on the man who has the knowledge not to disturb the life basis and thought basis of the ignorant so uh, in the beginning we have to learn to love truly and love rightly love an animal love the plant love people around and that's where when we try to do that people become very harsh and they believe that they are really loving the divine but <laughs> they not even love forget about loving the divine so that's the process through the world of relativity is we climb toward the absolute we cannot skip if we try to do it we may fall dhadam se so <laughs> so this is the whole thing and he says ki it creates disorder and confusion and we read the example of the senses which show us that the sun goes around the earth but uh, in reality earth goes around the sun and to a still greater vision the sun neither the sun nor the earth are alone going around each other but they are all shifting constantly in a massive jagatyam jagat cosmic movement but if you that's not how we orient our life so now we come to page 60 and he says it is very difficult to understand the human standpoint unless we is find a way to really become the divine for for the human to understand the divine standpoint unless in some way we find a way to become one with the divine and we can understand this from a simple example that when a child 5 year old does not understand the children who don't understand the ways of their parents or the teachers sometimes they even curse and of course parents being human they feel very bad they you know <laughs> get hurt but ultimately what is the last thing that a parent says when you grow up you will understand so when we grow up then the per- child understands oh yes so this is the process through which we have to uh, reach and on page 60 shurbindo reminds us second paragraph it is not very easy for the customary mind of man always attached to its past and present associations to conceive of an existence still human yet radically changed in what are now our fixed circumstances so here he is taking us still one step further because in traditional vedanta we have said this life life of ego this cannot change but yes there is a one non dual consciousness in which you can enter and you can start operating from there sab bhai bhai hindi chini bhai bhai india pakistan are going to become one let's start having cricket matches so this is how our human mind conceives it cannot understand that there is this utterance is from a height 
to which we right now have no access. So, we cannot imagine that while still being in this particular life, in this body, our life can change drastically. We are in respect to our possible higher evolution. Shubhinder is a real perfectionist, you know, he is using the word possible. <laughs> this possible is because he is logically arguing the case in the uh, court of the human mind. <laughs> That's what he is doing. The divine is literally coming down saying, you know, I know you will say, you can't say with surety. Okay, possible human evolution. In the position of the original ape of the Darwinian theory, it would have been impossible for that ape, leading his instinctive arboreal life in primeval forests, to conceive that there would be one day an animal on the earth who would use a new faculty called reason upon the materials of his inner and outer existence, who would dominate by that power his instincts and habits, change the circumstances of his physical life, build for himself houses of stone, manipulate nature's forces, sail the seas, ride the air, develop codes of conduct, evolve conscious methods for his mental and spiritual development. Too much for an ape. So we are much in that same position. When Sri Aurobindo tells us all these things, we say, okay, okay, fine. Like the ape would say, what is this houses of concrete and you know, flying in air and sailing on the sea. I don't even know what you mean. I can hardly jump in the sea and swim a little bit. What is sailing? He would ask. For everything he would have a question. And uh, Sri Aurobindo is patiently, if nothing else, life divine is a testimony to the immense love and compassion of Sri Aurobindo. He could have simply said, see, because I say so. <laughs> and we would have, thus saith Sri Aurobindo. But he is not doing it. He is taking us step by step. Why? Because he knows my children need to go from kindergarten to post-graduation and I cannot suddenly give them a knowledge for which they are not ready. So in the life divine, that is the beauty. It is taking us from step to step. And if such a conception had been possible for the ape mind, it would still have been difficult for him to imagine that by any progress of nature or long effort of will and tendency, he could himself develop into that animal. Supposing one day he dreamed that, oh, something about, when he wakes up in the morning, he'll say, what a weird dream I had. I saw myself without a tail. This was so shocking to me. And I couldn't jump from one tree to another. My God, it's horror. And I was sitting before some machine doing tuck, 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 tuck. I don't know what kind of... Oh my God, living in a stone house. Oof. And it was so cold. I don't know where the cold thing was coming from. That's how he would conceive. This is exactly how we respond to Sri and the truth of the life divine that he brings to us. So, he tells us this difficulty. Same difficulty arises when we use reason to conceptualize the divine. So he says, page 61, a little below, it is so that he conceives his gods. Now about human beings, there is a little passage. How do we conceive our gods? It is so that he constructs his heavens. But it is not so that his reason conceives of a possible earth and a possible humanity. He conceives of a heaven where all the unsatisfied desires upon earth are satisfied in that heaven. All the unfulfilled wishes are satisfied there. There our goodness will have a reward and we will have a revenge there. All those people whom we see, who don't, we don't like, will be suffering in some hell and we will rejoice seeing there. This is how he conceives. And we have the story of uh, Yudhishthir in one of these constructed, Mother and Sri Aurobindo speak of heavens and hells constructed by the human mind. Even in Savitri we see that book of the double twilight, the twilight of the heavenly ideal. We have constructed, that's how Vishwamitra could construct a heaven, annex for Trishanku. Trishanku is not allowed to enter with the body into heaven. And uh, he is Purvaj of uh, Raja Ramchandra. So Raja Ramchandra knew it. That's why when Shambhuk tried with the body to enter into heaven, he said, don't try it. You are only creating imbalance in the earth. That story is so sobering at man's efforts towards achieving physical immortality without understanding the essence and the root of the problem. 
So, anyways, so Trishanku, he is not allowed. So, Vishwamitra says, no problem, I will build for you a parallel heaven. Can we imagine a parallel universe into which he begins to dwell? So, these are heavens and hell which the human mind, which is tremendous formative power, has built. And as long as it is heaven, it's okay, you go and stay in your own heaven and then you come back. But when you construct a hell, which is so dangerous, at one place mother says that there was a man who had locked himself in a hell of his own making. And she would tell him, you don't need to be a, no, no, I have done a big sin. I am very guilty. I must be punished in, he was trying <laughs> to, and she said, no, no, you don't need to be in this hell. There is no such thing. And he just wanted to be there because he felt if he is in hell, he has suffered for his you know, that guilt was as was. So, these are constructs which we have made and human mind is very, very creative. And this we know very well, how people can in the best of circumstances create hell. And uh, I mean, one of them is of course, I feel living in the ashram, I mean honestly, one cannot imagine the kind of immense security and everything that one feels here. <coughs> and yet by our thoughts, even here we can create a miniature hell in our head. That's how human life operates. So, he continues, his dream of God and heaven is really a dream of his own perfection. But he finds the same difficulty in accepting its practical realization here for the, his ultimate aim as would the ancestral ape if called upon to believe in himself as the future of man. Yes, there is a heaven out there where there are faculties and where there are possibilities where you have you can live for a long time and all the time, I don't know, you have super fast 5G network, 6G network, readily available. You don't even need a mobile phone, you think and there it comes. So you cannot imagine, yeah, these things are nice for fantasizing and imagining, but they cannot ever manifest here. The problem is that whatever human mind can conceive, just like whatever ape mind can conceive, Whatever the human mind can conceive, it has, it will find the power to create it. This is the logic of nature. If you look at today, we have flying and Chandrayaan, thank God, uh, hopefully after two days it should land <laughs> nicely. So look at how it all started. Dream of flying. And people said, well, flying is an impossibility. Then somebody flew with uh, wax air, crashed into the see then another person you know flew in another way and so on and so forth and until ultimately man broke the barrier so ideal is realizable but there is a gap between the ideal and the practical life but what we do is instead of taking the patient long process we give it up because it's not immediately realizable and the surface appearances show us to the contrary that's what Shirobindo is leading us to And then, of course, he speaks about how reason operates. Page 62. The error of the practical reason is an excessive subjection to the apparent fact, which it can immediately feel as real and an insufficient courage in carrying profounder facts of potentiality to their logical conclusion. It's so interesting and important because in one of the five perfections, psychological perfection, mother has used the word aspiration as synonymous with courage. Like she uses the word sincerity for transparency. And it's so interesting because aspiration is to move and realize what today is just a dream. But it requires tremendous courage because without courage we cannot move. We, most of the time, we brush it aside as dream. It cannot be. Why? Because it is not. And because it is not, therefore it cannot be. If we use that logic, then creation itself could not be. So this is where he is taking us. That practical reason looks at things for the immediate gain. And that's why it's so important to sometimes, not sometimes, it is actually almost a rule of nature. At, at some point of time, one has to renounce the immediate gains for a long-term goal that one is seeking for. 
otherwise it doesn't work out so this is how and those who have the courage they do it and so shubindo continues next paragraph we see constantly <coughs> to minimize the causes of error pain and suffering science as its knowledge increases dreams of regulating birth and of indefinitely prolonging life if not of affecting the entire conquest of death but because we envisage only external or secondary causes we can only think of removing them to a distance and not of eliminating the actual roots of that against which we struggle this is the problem so dilip kumar roy had once written a letter to shiv bindu about ass and human being and he says nobody has ever seen an ass change into a human being and shiv bindu says yes because people have not known the process if you know the process you can change an ass into a human being and now you have even movies where people have actually shown that movie fly where a human being can be changed into a fly or develop those characteristics so actually if we know the process and that's where he is leading us towards that we are not able to do it or we are only able to push it because we don't know the process and we are thus limited because we strive against secondary perceptions and not towards root knowledge because we know processes of things but not their essence so process of things is that you know we are wanting the clouds to come but we don't know so we try to manipulate seed the clouds artificially there is rain all this we are trying but we don't know बादल क्या जाने किस छत पे भी बरसना है किस छत को भिगोना है वी डोंट नो वाट रियली मूव्स द इंटेंट इवन इन फिजिकल क्रिएशन विच इज हिडन वी डोंट अंडरस्टैंड दैट टोटल बैलेंस बट वेन वी अंडरस्टैंड इट वी कैन मैनुपलेट इन वेज विच वी कैन नॉट इमेजिन नाउ फॉर इंस्टेंस जस्ट बाई एन एक्ट ऑफ विल दैट ऑल दैट ही विल टॉक टू अस लाइक वैन गोलकुंड वॉज बींग कंस्ट्रक्टेड एंड दे वॉज घन घोर घटा आई मीन टू मच ऑफ possibility of rain and mrityunjay dai literally sends word and the mother tells it to sure bindo now if it rains they are putting the linten and it will be a uh, big problem sure bindo says nothing he just looks out and looks at the clouds and that's it <laughs> and as if everything is held back and when they finish the work when they really need water and that time the water starts pouring so there are ways and means even to master outer nature circumstances but if we try to do it only externally we will only exchange one set of circumstances for another and it applies as a universal law in life so whenever people would go to the mother and they would say i want to change my department she would say the same thing change yourself at one place she says by changing house uh, and circumstances you do not change the situations you find yourself in but if you change yourself you do not need to change the house or the circumstances because then the law is from within outward they will change or our whole perception of them will change to start with and even the outer circumstances which are a clumsy attempt to um, uh, express something which is going on within so this is what is difficult for the reason to understand but if we could grasp the essential nature and the essential cause of error suffering and death we might hope to arrive at a mastery over them which should be not relative but entire he is saying that yes it's possible to master death it's possible to master disease why because you have to go to the essence of the problem what is that essence he will tell us that's why he is very patiently i mean if one has to learn to be what a teacher should be and what a papa should be one should read the life divine he is not in a hurry i am telling you why don't you listen why don't you understand mandabuddhi no look at what pains he is taking to take us step by step that if you understand the real reason then you can eliminate it how logical this is what that real reason is i will explain there are many chapters we might hope even to eliminate them all together and justify the dominant instinct of a nature by the conquest of that absolute go- good bliss knowledge and immortality which our intuitions perceive as the true and ultimate condition of the human being this is the beauty 
our intuition wants that that's why whatever we may say 75% of humanity wants a perfect world here it's not interested in heaven because also it knows after some term we will be thrown back so it wants this to become perfect it's somehow inbuilt in our instinctively intuitively it is inbuilt within us why is it not because we don't know the process and shurabinda is here to tell us the process and give us the way so what is the essence now shurabinda brings this about the true ancient vedanta the vedanta of bhishma and krishna and you know that age of mankind that vedanta knew this and therefore it engaged with life and so much came out of that vedanta and this is the later vedanta which declared the world as an incorrigible nightmare so on page 63 the ancient vedanta presents us with such a solution in the conception and experience of brahman as the one universal and essential fact and the nature of brahman as sachidanand in this view the essence of all life is the movement of a universal and immortal existence the essence of all sensation and emotion is the play of a universal and self existent delight in being and this we can understand when we read an epic the mahabharata now when we pick up one scene and there are people who do that we uh, say see what is shown there dushashan how bhima is killing dushashan how horrible advocating violence um, but <laughs> i don't know we read the mahabharata it was such a joy something intuitively instinctively feels joy why because it's about victory ultimate victory of truth and good through all the challenges of life it is something amazing because it keeps that hope alive not only alive it says yes it is possible and man should never give up that's what the mahabharata is about the ramayana the story of dharma which rama keeps in his heart through all the challenges he never gives up dharma it is something so inspiring so amazing and people pick up one little episode here and one little episode there and try to uh, blow it out of proportion so vedanta basically tells us that the essence of all sensations meaning thereby if we can go into its root and it is so true for example if there is acute pain somewhere mother speaks of it as four steps to uh, getting free from pain so what happens there is a con concentration of consciousness there so pain is there now the mind adds to it amplifies it signals because this is the natural reaction that i must get rid of pain so mind keeps sending signal there is pain them there is pain do something do something and the mind is conditioned take a paracetamol take this take that uh, it's constantly going on but there is another remedy is to just relax that part this is something which at i mean in certain measures i have applied it may not be always applicable but i am sure people have applied and it works it just tries to because the essence of all things if we dive into the depths is peace and delight and you start relaxing that area mother says that like you are undoing a uh, mat which is folded badly and then just let that place be filled with the peace which is all within and it has this ability to heal it has this ability to take away that pain so there were people who could do it even as late as when uh, raman maharshi went through that surgery he went through without an anesthesia and if i am not mistaken amal kiran also amal da uh, he watched over his eye surgery and he knew all the steps what were they doing so there are possibilities within us which if we understand the essence of all experience is delight another example we can say that how ego distorts the perception if we are going on a road and somebody hits us from behind what is our instinctive reaction oh and you know if we don't turn and we even what kind of person blind or something when you see behind your good friend he wanted to give you a surprise then everything changes in an instance the same experience changes in an instance oh when when did you come so there are this is one of the practices in uh raj yoga how to change substitute one for another same with hate on the surface jealousy is on the surface if we go deep within we will discover the same love that oh this love is taken this form vicious form 
of hate, jealousy. But at the core there is love which is distorted on the surface. So life begins to change. The essence of all sensation and emotion is the play of a universal and self-existent delight in being. The essence of all thought and perception is the radiation of a universal and all-pervading truth. The essence of all activity is the progression of a universal and self-affecting good. So we can start seeing good in everything, in every activity that okay, there is a good which is working towards its own end through this process which ap apparently is ignorant and full of error. So when a child makes some diagram or something, he cannot even make a straight line. But you know that he cannot make a straight line today, but tomorrow this is the beginning for one day drawing geometrical patterns. So this is how we see that how truth is moving towards its own realization. But the play and movement embodies itself in a multiplicity of forms, a variation of tendencies, an interplay of energies. Multiplicity permits of the interference of a determinative and temporarily deformative factor, the individual ego. And the nature of the ego is a self-limitation of consciousness by a willed ignorance of the rest of its play. And its exclusive absorption in one form, one combination of tendencies, one field of the movement of energies. Ego is the factor which determines the reactions of error, sorrow, pain, evil, death. For it gives these values to movements which would otherwise be represented in their right relation to the one existence, bliss, truth and good. Two simple examples. One is when you watch a match. Now, if the match is, let us say, uh, Ireland and not India, but uh, Ireland and England. Oh, we will watch. Oh, wonderful shot. Oh, this was a wonderful ball. Regardless. But the moment it is India and Pakistan, there is no question of any good shot, any good shot by <laughs> Pakistan team is, oh my God, this is terrible. Why couldn't he field it? Now, this is the way ego reacts. And its classic example, one of the classic example is in Mahabharata. When Krishna is shooting arrows at, uh, in the Karna and Krishna fight, so once uh, Krishna shoots the arrow, uh, Arjuna shoots the arrow at uh, Karna, and his chariot goes 300 feet behind. And Krishna says, okay, good. And then when Karn shoots, his chariot shifts about 3-4 feet behind. And Krishna says, amazing. <laughs> so Arjuna says, what is this? <laughs> what is amazing about just moving 3-4 feet behind? You didn't appreciate me so much when the force impact of my arrow Pushed him 300 feet. He says, see Arjun, take the total account of things. To be fair, I am on your side, okay? And I am holding the Triloki, the three worlds. And on top of it, Hanumanji is sitting. At least learn to appreciate, even in the enemy, the skills after all. That's why he writes in, in the Gita that wherever there is anything which is good or preeminent, know that to be divine. So this is the logic that, well, in anything and everything. So this totality the ego cannot conceive. For the ego, I am right yesterday, I am right today, I will be right tomorrow and nobody other than me has the right to be right. This is where the ego starts erring. Supposing it, can, it says that yes, there is this right in me, there is this right in you, there is this which is right here, there, everywhere and it begins to see the essence. For instance, there are people who are full of goodwill. But this goodwill expresses itself ignorantly. There are people who are full of bad will. And yet when they act on the surface, it looks like they are doing good things. Like when they dole out uh, rewards and you know, what is that, free freebies. So it, they are actually crashing the entire national economy and this thing. But to an ignorant mind, oh, see how nice. Because he is doling out certain freebies. But to another mind which lives in the deep, lives in the deep seas, this is a very dangerous thing to do. So this is how we begin to see in the depths, the intention and the total movement. So the values begin to change. And so what we have to do is, we have to recover the right relation. Then Shobindu says, what happened subsequently? 
into later vedanta there crept and arrived at fixity the idea that the limited ego is not only the cause of the dualities but the essential condition for the existence of the universe no it is all maya ego that in the sense of uh, sankhya where suddenly ego is a principle of creation a dividing principle is using in that sense it is this universe is created by something which by its nature is fundamentally wrong erroneous it's a divided and dividing consciousness which has created this world and therefore the only way is to escape from it but in shrivindo's um, what he reveals to us is thus we return to the essentially evil and illusory nature of human existence and the vanity of all effort after perfection in the life of the world a real, because it doesn't go to in the initial vedanta it went to the essence there is the divine in all things but later vedanta cut the world away from god that this world by its very nature is incorrigible and there is the divine but he is somewhere far away transcendent absolute and this world is maya it is created by some kind of an illusory consciousness a relative good linked always to its opposite is all that here we can seek but if we adhere to the larger and profounder idea that the ego is only an intermediate representation of something beyond itself we escape from this consequence and are able to apply vedanta to the fulfillment of life and not only to the escape from life the essential cause and condition of universal existence is the lord ishwara or purusha manifesting and occupying individual and universal forms this is the original vedanta actually if we go into this that ghatghat mein he is the one and if that is the truth then that is the essence of all things and if that is the essence of all things it is perfectly logical to assume that man can arrive at that essence because it's in everything within us within now the process may be di- different in each one but we can touch that core within ourselves we can touch that core in everything and by touching it we can begin to effectuate a different understanding to start with and then a different action upon the world because now we are not reacting according to surfaces surface means your view versus my view go to the depth okay both of us actually want to be mean good we are only differing in our perceptions now you see a point of unity has been found in a unifying consciousness and then we can begin to work out the different ways but where we fundamentally say that this view is wrong this belongs to the devil and this belongs to god then there is no point of no meeting ground so he is reminding us that there is a original vedanta which says that god is in all things isha vasyam idam sarvam yat kinch jagat yam jagat and this is a later vedanta which somewhere started taking it that god is or the brahman is absolute uh, it is beyond nature behind nature beyond the play somewhere in a state which we have to ascend and merge with but the original vedanta is the sarv khal vidam brahman all this that is is the brahman not just neti neti so this is what shurabindu is reestablishing yesterday someone was asking about the traditional vedanta and shurabindu's vedanta this is shurabindu's vedanta just he has laid a basis of it is so much more he will develop it but the foundation must be clear and that foundation is the divine dwells in all things and see how shurabindu's whole responses change in alipur jail he discovered it actually and that's why from he says from that time onwards he stopped giving any counsel to the uh, advocate chitranjan uh, i was going to say chitranjan da okay <laughs> he he would come and ask him you tell me he said he will inspire you because he had seen that truth and what had he seen shri krishna telling him don't you worry i have brought you here and i will take you out of when when it is when the work is over and when there is a new work so after that shurbindo lived in that state of wonderful surrender that okay he has brought me here for a purpose and he will take me when that purpose is over towards a greater purpose and he shows him that i am in the your um, 
lawyer. I am also in the lawyer of the other side. I will make him speak what I want him to make. He's got an absolute assurance. And I am also in the judge. I will eventually make him pass the judgment. But it requires tremendous courage, a leap of faith and an absolute surrender. That's what we see in Sri Much more than people uh, show him as... Con whenever they have this image of Sri Aurobindo, he's closing eyes and meditating. Yes, okay. But first of all, he meditated with open eyes, meaning thereby he was always aware of the surface reality of the world and the deeper truth behind. That is what is Shurabindu with open eyes. And the second thing which he is always aware, that ultimately it is the divine will which is fulfilled in creation, whatever time and through whatever circumstances. And that's what is the great mantra to be remembered. Satya meva jayate namritam satya nepantha vithato devyana. And we see it even in recent times. People get so disheartened. Look at the First World War, Second World War, look at the imperialism, look at Mughals. So many invasions came. Ultimately, what stood erect? And not only is erect, he is kicking and alive, is the India of Sanatan Dharma. How this has happened? In our own life, we can see a living proofs. We don't have to go very far into mythology and scriptures to see this. We can see it today that how truth ultimately survives. The limited ego is only an intermediate phenomena of consciousness necessary for a certain line of development. So all these part of the play were needed. Why? Because India had gone too much post-Buddhism, post-Shankara, Bhaj Govindam, Bhaj Govindam, Bhaj Govindam, Mood Mate. Punarapi Janamam, Punarapi Maranam, Punarapi Janani, Jatare Shainam. So, very hopeless situation. <laughs> then, first God sent Greeks. You shake them up. But still, there was Chanakya and Chandragupta Maurya, <laughs> which were carrying the flame of Shri Krishna still within them. Shubhindo speaks about them. Chandragupta Maurya, he was a vibhuti even. Durai Swami Ayyar, I believe, was Chandragupta Maurya in his previous life. So they were carrying that flame. So they resisted. After that, again, Buddhism. You see, after Chandragupta Maurya, the same during that time, Magad Naresh goes into Buddhism and once again, uh, all this uh, theory in <laughs> Ashoka, all this greatness uh, had, you know, gone down that. So he said, okay, I am going to send <laughs> the Mongols. And the Mongols were the cruelest of people. They came till Kashmir and creating a havoc. Then he said, no, no, these are too much. So the Mughals came. And in a way, they <laughs> rescued us from the Mongols. It was fight between two cruel, one greater and one lesser, lesser evil. So the Mongols never actually took over the throne. And then <laughs> even Mughals brought in the challenge, giving rise to Shivaji and Maharana Pratap. Look at, you know, the Chhatra Tej, which was diminishing. Shri Krishna ensured that it is kept alive and it ignites the entire nation. Every time it began to fail, he would suddenly erect his barrier. The play of surface he goes. And when the time came, through a whisper, like you, you know, Phuk Sevdadena, the Mughal entire empire collapsed like anything. Today we have some descendant who is some... Uh, <laughs> making <laughs> chai in some place in Faizabad. I mean, just imagine. This is the state that ultimately how truth wins. Then the Britishers came and nobody believed that they will leave. And while we give credit to Gandhi, but it is not because of him. Now history has testified this, that it is not because of him. The world conditions had become such, exactly what Sri said. The world conditions will become such that they will have to leave. And they realized that this was a cow they had sucked to the last drop of milk. There was famine. There was no money to pay to the soldiers to maintain the army. And above all, there was revolt, naval revolt, many kinds of revolt. Indian army was revolting, I mean, British army. And so they realized, boss, achche se, puch dawa ke bhagne se achche. So they, ah, we are giving you independence. They had no choice. Even though we messed it up, bungled it up, okay. Look at how the play unfolds. And yet all this was required. Imagine how Sri Aurobindo awakened the whole nation when the British had, you know, and Rani Jhansi had the last flame with which Sri Krishna's stage had gone. 
and he awakens a whole nation to uh, through Durga Stotra. Now, so when we look at this in a large perspective, then we say, ah, ah, ah so wonderful is the play. But those who are caught in the moment when they see, oh, Khudiram is being hanged, oh, Ram Prasad Bismil, what has happened? Why isn't God doing something about them? God was looking 70 years ahead, 100 years ahead, that one day they will all come back and they will contribute to the good of a rising and shining India. So this is how the divine acts. But we see very, very short-sighted in our own life also, in larger movements also. So he says, following this line, so what is, again he comes back to the same point. Because right now there is the play of the ego, we don't understand the play. Therefore, escaping from the world is not our highest consummation. But following this line, the individual can arrive at that which is beyond himself. Nurture the dream. This is what is called as, uh, you know, nurturing the dream. Nurturing the dream is not, I want to have a company and I'll one day make it. Okay, at least learn to dream. Nurture the dream. Like Da Vinci nurtured the dream of flying in the air and much before that, our ancestors. Nurture the dream that one day this world will become beautiful. Every day, in the face of every contrary circumstance, Aspiration should intensify. Ma, may this world become true and good and beautiful and divine. This is what is required of us. So he says, following this line, the individual can arrive at that. Now individual, he is using the word. Not individual vanish, because individual, if it is ego, then he vanish into Brahman. But the individual, he has not yet brought in the psychic being. It comes later on. The False individuality is the ego, behind it is the psychic being. But he is not introducing us, us here. It will come later and there are reasons why it comes later. One of the reasons is the psychic being is a term that the mother brought with her. The experience is known, but the mother brought that. And entire that evolution of the soul. So later on when Sri wrote six completely new chapters, which include the tri triple transformation. Later on, we see this word psychic being entering into Shivindu's uh, treatise. <clears throat> I don't know what word to say. I can't say Shivindu's philosophy. I can't use the word Shivindu's vocabulary. All this seems so <laughs> foolish. So, he says, following this line, the individual can arrive at that which is beyond himself, that which he represents and can yet continue to represent it no longer as an obscured and limited ego but as a center of the divine and of the universal consciousness embracing, utilizing and transforming into harmony with the divine all individual determination. This is our work. But for that, instead of the ego, we must live in the deeper individual, the true I, the true self the psychic being and at the same time in the larger universality and then we do whatever we are meant to do. We don't have to leave what we are doing. A doctor doesn't have to leave the work because it is his ego. No, he has to become a true divine healer. A teacher doesn't have to leave the work because he says I am in ignorance. He has to go higher and higher in true knowledge and then express it which goes beyond the notebooks. That example with which we can close Sri Aurobindo in Baroda, he would teach the life of Nelson when he was teaching. Some students said, but sir, uh, first of all, <laughs> he would, this is not there in the notes and whatever we have read till now. Shabinda says, throw your notes out of the window. Oh, you see, there is a truth that he is seeing and he is revealing that. And we can close with this. somewhere down the middle, we have in egoistic formation the intermediate and decisive factor which allows the one to emerge as the conscious many. That's how individuality starts with the ego. Animals don't have an ego. So this idea that we shouldn't have an ego and become an animal, that's why he says ego is the helper. But ego is the bar. After a point, once the ego is like that uh, ice cream wala, what is it called? Outer. Sacha, kya bolte hai usko? Kulfi ka 
A cone, okay. Cone, but that used to be, no, in old time. Ah, mold, correct. So in that mold, each one has to become many. So in one mold, he adds pista flavor. In the other mold, he adds butterscotch. Third mold, vanilla. Fourth mold, he adds bitter chocolate. Some will like, some won't like. So they are different molds. Essence is same. It is milk, cream, whatever. I don't know about ice cream. But I, I suppose it's at least cream, which they are made out of milk. Essence is same. But the flavors are different. You may like one, somebody may like another. But the divine mixes everything and has a nice kichadi, uh, sun, super sunday ice cream. So individual is, this mold is required in the beginning. Mold is the ego. And when the time has come, when we have to give it to the divine, then we can't say, take me with the mold. He say, wait, you don't know what is inside the mold. I am looking for that. And he will remove the mold and take that ice cream. And then he will say, so we must, we have to go through that process. Prematurely, we can't give him adha, pakka adha ice cream. He will say, what kind of a fellow you are? Go back, become a proper ice cream. So, this is the purpose of the ego. And... Uh, Uh, we have the dissolution of this egoistic construction by the self-opening of the individual to the universe and to God. Okay, last line I'll read, page 65. And we have the outflowing of the infinite and absolute existence, truth, good and delight of being on the many in the world as the divine result towards which the cycles of our evolution move. This is the supreme birth which material nature holds in herself. Of this she strives to be delivered. Meaning thereby each one of us must ultimately become a radiating divine center of the light, freedom, unity, love, truth, force, beauty, ananda of the divine. This is the consummation. But we are in a hurry to escape. And this hurrying to escape or we are in a hurry to conclude looking at life's surface and apparent appearances that life is a horror, it's a nightmare well, let people feel it a horror and wake up from the dream and find wherever they are but for us this is what is given to us as the highest possibility and this possibility is logical because if God is hidden behind nature nature must ultimately unveil God it's a very plain and simple logic so we'll stop here. After 10 minutes, we'll come back and continue.